Good evening, uh, everybody. Uh, it is great to be here today uh, with the three three other uh, fellow arbitration professionals who are associated with the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. Uh, I would welcome uh, Athena, Mercy, and Nasser. Uh, thank you so much for uh, joining me today. This session uh, is being broadcast uh, live on a number of Facebook pages and YouTube channels, namely uh, those of Courting the Law, Kanun Dan, uh, and in SAF camp. The audience is primarily the members of the Pakistani legal community and others who are interested in law and justice related matters in Pakistan. Of course, Nasir uh, has a legal background uh, and is a Pakistani, but he's a, a number of other things as we'll discuss uh, later on today. Uh, and hence, uh, so is the audience. Uh, th so thank you for joining me. Uh, Mercy, for those who are just joining us, uh, is a research and academic affairs manager at the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and is a US qualified arbitration professional. Athena uh, is a Greek lawyer who works with a, with a prominent international law firm in Paris at the moment uh, and is an experienced uh, arbitration lawyer and has been associated uh, with, the, with a number of uh, arbitrations, both ad hoc and institutional, um, in different capacities uh, as well. And, and Nasir, uh, you, you know, it's a, uh, he's one of those people uh, who's difficult to describe because he is qualified as an engineer, as a lawyer, as a chartered quantity surveyor, as a chartered procurement professional, as a qualified mediator, adjudicator, mm -hmm. and arbitrator. So uh, thank you, Nasir, uh, for joining. And uh, what is also more uh, important is that Nasir is leading the efforts to uh, set up the, the Pakistan branch of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. So thank you all for, for joining us. Uh, if I may, I'll start with Nasir. Any any introductory remarks before we dive into the subject? Uh, thank you, Temur. Thank you, Mercy and Athena. Thank you, everybody uh, watching this uh, live broadcast at the moment. Uh, introductory comments, definitely. Uh, the question comes back is about the subject that we are discussing. Why is it important uh, with regards to having access to justice, having easier access to justice, why arbitration or alternative dispute resolution is important, specifically in Pakistan, uh, where we've been seeing uh, lots of efforts from the legal fraternity to try and improve it. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we will discuss a little bit about the efforts done uh, to implement the Alternative Dispute Resolution Act in Pakistan as well. Um, so introductory comments are, Thank you for this platform, Temur, that you have created for awareness, because without these efforts, um, how are we going to reach out to the common people where access to justice is the most important? Thank you, Nasir. Mercy, over to you. Well, good evening, everyone. I, I know um, that it's quite late there where you're probably listening from, and um, thank you very much for the invitation to come and speak to you tonight on behalf of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. Um, whenever we have the opportunity to talk about alternative dispute resolution and how it, um, how it underpins, as Nasir was saying, access to justice, but also the rule of law in the world, we're quite happy to do that. Um, welcome everyone for, uh, for listening tonight. And I hope that everyone will gain some, even if it's not new understanding about alternative dispute resolution and arbitration, even if you already know about it, that perhaps you will gain some uh, excitement and enthusiasm about continuing along the path that you've chosen. Athena. Thank you. It's my turn. Thank you very, very much, Taimur, for, for having us here. Uh, thank you very much to the panelists for, for participating in, the, in this discussion. And thank you very much to all of you uh, who have decided to postpone the beginning of your evening free time to, to listen more about justice and alternative dispute resolution and, and building a network. And uh, I am quite enthusiastic to, to participate in this discussion. And I think that this is what CRB is all about at the end. Uh, it's about building a network, building bridges and uh, in, introducing uh, ways to do things 
well uh, to, to the world globally and, and providing a framework for discussing and exchanging ideas and, and know-hows, know-how. So very glad to be here. Thank you very much. So, uh, Mercy, if I could ask you uh, that, you know, what do you see, why do you think ADR is relevant and arbitration is relevant and what role does uh, the Chartered Institute play uh, in its development around the world uh, and not just in UK? Um, please. Wow, why is ADR important in the world? That's a, that's a very big question. Um, and I would say um, the more options that people have for resolving their disputes or for obtaining justice, then the more um, secure we are as a civilization in uh, knowing that the law is there to protect and help people. So, for example, if if the only option that someone had, if they if they had a dispute with their neighbor, if the only option that they had was to go to the courts, that may sound like access to justice. But if you look at the individual situation, it may not be. Um, for example, it may be expensive. It may be far away. It may be that the court system has a schedule that will mean that the dispute will go on longer than the neighbors have to sort out their issue. Um, it may mean also that when, once you're in court that there's only a certain number of options for the outcome that could be quite harsh. So while you have access, you may not in fact have an equitable outcome. Alternative dispute resolution on the other hand is controlled by the parties. Um, it's very much determined by the parties themselves what happens which gives parties much more flexibility in, in the outcome of the dispute and making sure that the way their disputes are resolved are actually tailored to fit their needs and their situation. And so rather than having things uh, imposed upon you uh, with alternative dispute resolution, you have the opportunity to really engage in obtaining your own justice. The more that people are able to do this in a way that is uh, actually resolving disputes and actually having parties be able to say that's over i now put that aside and can move forward the better it is for everyone and this is in terms not just of i mean mostly we all practice in commercial law but but even in family law and criminal law and um, international law and many levels of law this this idea of being able to actually resolve your dispute and move on is very important and alternative dispute resolution offers you many options for doing that, uh, which improves parties not only access to obtain justice, but also uh, supports the rule of law uh, globally. So that's why we think it's important. As far as the Chartered Institute, as far as our role, um, the Chartered Institute has been around for more than 100 years. And I can tell you that our role in this has definitely changed uh, from from its inception. I would say, I would note here that um, our founder, uh, over 100 years ago, the man who actually founded the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, he, he got the idea after having traveled extensively in the East and in Asia. Um, he converted to Islam and decided that his, his life mission was to establish an institution to promote these very civilized and alternative dispute resolution mechanisms because he thought that it was not only part of his uh, duty as a lawyer, but also uh, part of his personal mission um, to, to bring justice to the world and to help with you know obtaining peace. So if you think about the, t the way that the world was back in 1914 when this all started, it's very different than it is now. And yet the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators has maintained uh, relevance in the industry over this time. Um, because, it, and as is our logo, we evolve to resolve. So we, re, we respond to the needs of society. Um, one of the needs is always training. As ADR has become more popular, people need legal training in actually how to engage in the processes. And so that's one of the major things that we do is we train people in alternative dispute resolution. But the other major part, there's two other major things that I believe we do. One is that we are a membership organization. So once people obtain training, they can become a member of a global community that will help support them as they are you know, engaging either as a, as a party or as a practitioner or as an expert in these processes. So that's one thing. 
um, building a community of practitioners. And then the other thing is being a thought leader. So having a stage where we can discuss what's happening in ADR, um, look at the important issues, really dissect them and come up with solutions. Um, so we try to also be a thought leader um, as well as a trainer and a membership community. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mercy. And before we uh, started the session, we were talking about how you grew up in, uh, in Africa and, and that ADR really traces its roots back uh, hundreds, of, hundreds of years, if not longer, in our societies. Uh, and Nasir, would you like to say anything about that, the uh, importance and relevance of ADR? Not just in today's world, but you know. You know Absolutely. I think um, um, as Mercy very kindly pointed it back to the Islamic way or the Asian way, I'll, I'll take back on the lineage of arbitration or ADR. Um, we're very familiar with the Jirga system in Pakistan where the elders decide the dispute. If you look at the basic definition of ADR, it's basically anything that is not going to the court, the alternative of that dispute resolution is ADR. And what people are now talking about is calling ADR not alternative dispute resolution, but actually accessible dispute resolution. So the common person who does not have access to reaching courts, who does not have access to obtaining um, legal help, legal aid, can obtain dispute resolution through that. So, uh, I mean, uh, if you look at the old history, the Indian Arbitration Act 1899 hailed from, uh, you know, the panchayat system, um, all of those things dictate us in a way to, to walk towards the path of ADR. And then with the effectiveness, uh, the cost effectiveness, the timeliness. And as um, I'll give Mercy's um, example of the dispute with the neighbor, let's say a small boundary effect. If for that you have to go to the court, it's not going to help out a lot. If I give the UK's example, I was involved in a very small case for one of my friends. So I was doing pro bono. Uh, it was um, in the 20s of thousand pounds. So not, not a big sum of money if you consider the UK's dispute issue. A small claims court and the court gave the hearing date, which was in 13 months. So if you wow. had gone to ADR to do that, and that's the UK. And I know the dates in Pakistan could be similar. You could be talking, you know, years, if not months. So, so in that essence, why would you go to the court to resolve your issue when ADR can give you equal justice at the same, um, in the in the same uh, quali qualitative uh, and quantitative perspective? So of course, ADR gives you automatic um, preference. Athena, uh, coming to you, like me, you work at a at a major global law firm. Uh, you know, and we are all in sitting in different countries and different places. We belong to uh, you know different parts of the world. So, so uh, how do you see ADR and uh, arbitration, and especially from uh, from the perspective of your current role at a global law firm? Uh, I assume you do mainly more commercial work. Uh, yes. You know, please. Uh, uh, I, effectively, I, I work with uh, Everson Sutherland, uh, which is a, huge, a, a very big uh, law firm uh, with uh, offices all around the world. I do arbitration and uh, in our team, practically, we only have international arbitrations. Uh, which means that the, the parties come from different backgrounds, different countries. We also deal with uh, international investment arbitrations, uh, being arbitrations between a national state and a foreign investor, uh, an investor from another state. Lastly, we also deal with um, disputes b before specific tribunals who are entrusted to, um, to, to deal with international disputes state to state, so between two sovereign states. So having seen all this very wide scope of disputes involving different industries, different countries, different factual and legal backgrounds, having seen um, parties with extremely different needs coming to arbitration, 
uh, what, uh, apart from what we have already discussed as, as the, the, the need, the, the reasons why arbitration is needed and, and the gaps that it has come to fulfill, and another major issue is, is neutrality. Uh, my clients would be totally disinclined to go before the national courts of their county counterparty because they not necessarily trust the local, the foreign for them, judicial system. Uh, when it comes to a dispute between an investor and the state, uh, the investor would be quite reluctant to to solve, to, re, to resolve their dispute before the national courts of the state. And of course, the state as a state cannot uh, appear before the national tribunals of a third state. So arbitration and mediation and, and, and an alternative dispute resolution offers the possibility to, to take the dispute before people who have no obvious, at least, bias uh, in favor of one side or, or the other. And, uh, and, and, and definitely another huge advantage is the possibility to have the proceedings tailor-made. Uh, arbitration can, uh, can be a very good way or mediation can be a very good way for resolving a dispute of a couple of thousand pounds, as you mentioned, and, and uh, a, a couple of billions uh, as well. Uh, and uh, the same people who run it know how to um, how, how to use the procedural tools that we have in order to make every proceeding suitable for the specific uh, dispute before us. Thank Athena, you. You, you are also uh, the elected chair of the young members group of the Chartered Institute. So what does that role involve? Uh, and uh, who qualifies as a young member? Uh, you know, and uh, do you also see any members from Pakistan? Um, I don't know if I should uh, start uh, with uh, a, a step backwards and say what the young members group is before mm -hmm. discussing about yeah, the, the steering committee which I chair. Uh, the, uh, the young members group of the CR is the community uh, of uh, CR members who are below 40 years old. So this is what young uh, means today, hopefully in a, in a couple of years time. Young will mean less than 50. That, that's, that's my personal <laughs> uh, <Right>. then <laughs> then we within, the, within the band. Yeah. Who are the young members? What are the profiles? Uh, young practitioners. Uh, practitioners generally in dispute resolution. It can be arbitration. It can be mediation. It can be um, uh, court uh, uh, ju judicial uh, uh, litigation and, 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 and other similar proceedings. Um, who it can also be, apart from practitioners, students. Uh, a, a lot of our members are students in universities, uh, specializing or willing to specialize in, uh, in dispute resolution. Uh, and I, I would say that the, like, the, the common characteristic of, of CR members are people who are curious, uh, who want to know what's happening around, um, who have realized that building one's career is not just, I don't know, get good marks at university and, and, and do good work, but also creating a network and meeting people and, and challenging one's own ideas about how to do things. Um, and, and this is an opportunity that uh, one can, uh, can, can satisfy uh, being a member of, of uh, the young members group. Now, about the Global Steering Committee, of which I am the, the, the chair, uh, the Global Steering Committee is a group of uh, 15 people today um, from different nationalities and, and practitioners based in, in different areas um, from Africa, Europe, Asia, the, the, the Americas, who have as mission uh, to coordinate the activities of the various uh, local uh, young branches of, of CRB uh, around the world, and uh, to also think of initiatives and put forward initiatives uh, concerning all young uh, chartered uh, Institute of Arbitrators young member group. I can, we can discuss a bit more about the, the, the activities. I would be very more than happy to, to discuss about this. Uh, just to answer your question about the nationality of the members, 
I don't know. Uh, I don't have statistics about the nationality of the mem of the young members of uh, of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. I'm, I'm sure that there are people from from Pakistan, uh, definitely. When it comes to members of uh, the Global Steering Committee, uh, I, unfortunately, for the time being, there is no Pakistani member of our 15 uh, uh, person reach uh, committee. But hopefully, there will be in the future. In the near future, and I can talk to uh, and I can talk about this also later. But I don't want to monopolize the discussion, so we can we can come back to that. No, no. Th thank you for this information. Uh, Pakistanis, uh, even those uh, barristers working in Pakistan, uh, have now made it to the bar representation committee of their uh, inns in in UK, especially Lincoln's Inn. Uh, mm -hmm. We all like to be called to the bar from Lincoln's Inn. In my case, that's true as well because our founding father Jinnah was uh, called to the bar there. Uh, so there's no reason why you know lawyers who are listening to this uh, broadcast, if they're interested, could not be part of uh, uh, you know your group and eventually the steering uh, committee as well. Uh, Mercy, I just wanted to ask you, uh, so how many members in total uh, does the Chartered Institute have uh, globally at the moment? Well, we are. Uh, approaching 17,000, so we're at 16,000 and some change, like 16,700 and something, I believe. Um, but that increases every day. And uh, yes, I would point out that quite quite a significant growing portion of those members are young members, um, in particular student members. Um, we began an initiative um, maybe two years ago to increase our student membership. Um, and just for everyone who's out there listening who may not know this, student membership with the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators is free. So there's no cost to join if you're a student, if you're still in law school. So if you haven't done that, it's a simple matter of going to our website, clicking on the membership and signing up for student membership. So I encourage you to do that if you haven't done. But uh, I would note that we went from several hundred student members to several thousand student members in a couple of years. And so this just went to show the amount of interest that there is in the young, um, especially law students from around the world. Um, we, we do see that some of the, the demographics are very interesting. So if you look at a branch by branch uh, sort of mapping, um, the, the older branches, so for example, branches in the UK, uh, North America branch is not actually that old, but if you look at um, the European branch, branches like that, you have um, more fellows and not that many younger members, uh, not that many associate members or student members. And, and we noticed that in places like the Nigeria branch is a great example. I think maybe 75% of the Nigeria branch are actually associate members or student members. So um, we do see that it does, it does make a difference what region of the world that you're in as far as how many young members there are, but we do see that around the world, the trend for young members is definitely growing. Um, our student numbers now are, are, I think, going to potentially meet with the uh, associate um, member numbers very soon. So um, it's a very active and vibrant student network as well as uh, the students have the benefit as well, as well as well as of being in the young members group with the younger practitioners. So a lot of the young members are actually associate members or full members. And this is great because they get to sort of meet together and mentor one another. Um, so being a part of the YMG is, is very beneficial if you're a very young practitioner and sort of looking for ways to get involved. Excellent. So I think th this is very useful. Uh, and I see that, you know, it's been posted on the relevant pages as well that student membership is free uh, at the Chartered Institute. So people uh, should take advantage of that. Uh, you know, and become part of a global network and utilize the resources uh, that the institute offers. Nasir, uh, how many members do we have? Or members meaning from associate members to fellows uh, from Pakistan at the moment? I think in terms of the statistics, it's about um, just over 50 members in total from Pakistan. Um, there's about 11 fellows, uh, me being one of them. Uh, although not based in Pakistan now. Uh, there is um, about 20 plus associates, the rest are all members, which is great. But one thing, as Mercy's just mentioned, you will be surprised to know 
there is not a single student member from Pakistan. That's, I think that might change today. <laughs> that, hopefully, hopefully, that will change. Yeah. As soon as you know, I mean, F R W E free is mentioned, and yeah. it's not just about you know having free membership. What are you going to get out of it? Um, I think I think that's more important. I think it's it's a learned society with you know over 169 countries with membership, uh, and I want to talk about the 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 global standard why CIAB is important and just about the relevance to Pakistan as well. What the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators does is it creates a consistent and quality assured professional delivery of all forms of dispute resolution and dispute avoidance. It's not just arbitration, it's mediation, it's adjudication, and also entertains not only the practitioners, but also the receivers of the service, so the customers who want to use it. So the institution is not just for legal practitioners, it's for engineers and it's for doctors, because one of the benefits that it creates for alternative dispute resolution practitioners, people like myself, uh, is if you have, um, a, say, a construction dispute, which is related to time or it's related to an engineering defect, and if you go to your specific court system in Pakistan, you are at the mercy of what type of judge you are going to face in that relevant aspect. But if you go to alternative dispute resolution scenario, the person who's dealing with your dispute, because the parties can choose that person, you can choose whether you want an engineer to look at your engineering dispute. You can choose a lawyer if you have got a problem with the interpretation of the clauses of the contract. You can choose um, a delay analyst if you've got extension of time or time delay issues. So that's just, you know, one aspect uh, from that perspective. So hopefully um, with, with that element, we will be able to see more information flow because it goes back to the point of um, what, what is the relevance of CIAP to Pakistan and goes back to the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators manifesto, which which, has, which was published back in 2015, and it's got five key streams in it. And I'm going to try and summarize them very quickly. The first one, very much a coordinated legal education and business engagement strategy. So people who are the givers and the users of ADR, they know about what is going to happen, how it's going to happen. And that is something I see very much in development stage in, in country like Pakistan the government to play a leading role. Um, first time we met Temur was at the eighth judicial conference back in 2018. And okay. it was a great initiative from that perspective because the whole conference was structured around alternative dispute resolution. And one of the recommendations from it, which I can you know, take my, myself uh, on it, was basically to have a coordinated legal education. Uh, and that was one of the recommendations made on it. The, the review by the government, the construction strategist, to look at how ADR plays a benefit to the wider economy. Um, so it's something the government has to help out with that. The use of dispute boards. So that's very important because Pakistan has so many World Bank funded contracts, um, CPEC, other elements where dispute boards can help um, significantly, especially the forms of contracts being used in Pakistan from that perspective. Uh, so that's another uh, element of CIOB's manifesto. And then the last one very much is um, a skills framework, which is the golden thread um, of education, of professional development and standards. So, so all of these five kind of CIOB manifesto automatically fit in to the needs and requirements of where Pakistan is in its journey of alternative dispute resolution. If I could jump in too, Timer, if you, if you don't if you don't mind, uh, I would like to point out that I actually started as a student member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators myself uh, many years ago, and then attained associate membership and full membership. Um, the ability to meet with other professionals in your home region and to to have them tell you things like what Nasir is saying, um, I personally did not know. Uh, entirely how my the, the benefits that I that I personally brought to the profession how how do I find where I fit in how do I 
um, what do I have that I highlight to a potential employer? What is it that I should focus on? Um, being part of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, I met mentors who were able to tell me, um, this based on your background, your experience here, you should do this, you should probably do that. And I was able to meet with um, some of the more preeminent practitioners in my, in my area and um, some of the preeminent practitioners in the world, in fact, and get actual direct advice on things like what Nasir is saying. Um, and so what is the benefit to becoming a student member? It puts you on a pathway that can actually affect your entire practice quite significantly. Even if you don't see it immediately, I'm not saying that by becoming a student member, someone's going to just show up with a job offer you know, to be you know, a, an arbitration lawyer at some major firm all of a sudden. But you will learn how you can contribute, what it is that you have that you can contribute at that moment to your community of practitioners. Excellent. So, uh, Athena, I would like to uh, you know, raise, a, raise a point here with you, and perhaps you can shed some light on it. Uh, in Pakistan, we see that uh, there are very few large law firms. Most of the lawyers are self-employed practitioners working in smaller chambers or with a senior, uh, with a senior lawyer. Uh, and uh, we see that they waste a lot of time in, in bar politics uh, you know, and don't really take... Oh, okay, of course, with quoting the law, Kanundan and Saf Camp, that's changed a bit. We uh, see a lot of volunteer lawyers taking part in them. Uh, but generally, we see people working in law firms don't give time to even the legal education committee of the Bar Council uh, or its activities, it, with the exception of a few. Pakistan has 150,000 lawyers uh, mm -hmm. and legal practitioners. So it's, it's a big community. Whereas at, at firms like yours and, and mine at Clyde & Co. and at Evershed, we see that um, lawyers, especially senior lawyers, are encouraged to give back to the profession by doing what we are doing right now, or like you do uh, in, in the form of your involvement with the young members group of the Chartered Institute. So uh, how important is that uh, for people working even in, in law firm environments uh, to be involved in profession, uh, professional uh, activities of this nature? I, I would say that when it comes to at least uh, international dispute resolution, it's, it's key uh, to one's uh, career. It's, it's key to one's good practice of the profession. And, and I'm very confident that uh, mm. young people in Pakistan will start uh, participating more in, uh, in, in, in initiatives and uh, training of, uh, uh, schedules and uh, sorry, training modules and the opportunity to to learn things. Um, when I, I, I practice in the Paris bar and uh, we we have to uh, participate in trainings and uh, give trainings as well when, when we can. Uh, personally, I found that I find that having the possibility to exchange uh, with people from different backgrounds to um, be aware of um, relevant news and developments in international arbitration that happen somewhere else in the globe, having the opportunity to learn about ways that people in other parts of the world do things differently compared to our practice, it's extremely enriching. I, um, since recently, perhaps for the far for the last five years, I, I, I am appointed from time to time as an arbitrator. And I think that being a part, having been part uh, of, uh, of communities of, of lawyers all around the world helps me so much in, in really providing a good service to, to the parties because I'm flexible, because I can, I can think not only in terms of what I have learned, uh, what my colleagues do, what uh, we do in France or at Everstead Sutherland or you name it, but also what is done in other places of the world, what different parties may expect. Um, and uh, so I, I, I could not believe more in, in joining networks in, in general, rather in, in opening up, in opening one's horizons and seeing what's happening uh, not next to us, but a bit far away. 
Okay, no, thank you for that. Uh, Mercy, a couple of questions for, for you actually from the, from the audience. Uh, one is that, can you share uh, the membership requirements for the, for the benefit of the prospective applicants? And secondly, from a young lawyer, uh, what kind of courses are offered by the Chartered Institute? Any that are currently being offered that stand out? Well, membership requirements, let's start there. Um, and I'll, uh, this is in detail available on our website, but some people do go to our website and, and still find that they're a little confused as to where exactly they would fit in. And the reason is because we have many pathways to membership. Um, we have many pathways to membership because not everyone comes to ADR in the same way. Um, we all come with our different backgrounds, with our different levels of experience in different areas. And so that's why we have lots of options. So for example, if you're already a lawyer and you've already worked in ADR, we would have an accelerated pathway for you to take. But generally speaking, um, if you are still a law student, you would do student membership. If you are um, a young practitioner who is interested, knows that they're interested in alternative dispute resolution, but maybe hasn't had extensive training, but you have a legal qualification, then you would come in at what we call associate level. Once you have obtained a certain amount of experience in, AD, in alternative dispute resolution, and I should also point out this isn't just for lawyers. So if you're um, an accountant, an engineer, an architect, uh, a surveyor, um, anyone, I, I would even encourage, in fact, my personal encouragement, if there's anyone out there who is currently involved in technology and in um, creating web platforms, please, please get some alternative dispute resolution training because we need you. Um, it, whatever background you're from, if you simply want the experience but you haven't gotten it yet or you want the knowledge, then you would come in at associate level. Um, member level means that you've participated in a certain amount of ADR. That can be adjudication, mediation, arbitration, many different types. Um, the reason we kind of focus this at lawyers is because lawyers tend to uh, meet these qualifications faster uh, simply because of the nature of their work, but that doesn't mean this is exclusive to lawyers. Um, a full member would have about five to 10 years of experience. And then um, a fellow would have about 10 years of experience or would be someone who had direct training in, you know, some kind of alternative dispute resolution process. So for example, a, an arbitration fellow would have demonstrated that they can write an arbitral award that is con uh, enforceable under the New York Convention. They may have done this in actuality or they may have done this under exam settings. Um, like I say, we have many different pathways. Now, once you've actually sat as an arbitrator, and this is specifically for arbitration, um, if you've sat as an arbitrator a certain number of times for a certain number of years, you can become a chartered arbitrator, which is probably our most, uh, I guess, prestigious, you would say, status um, that we have of membership. So in a nutshell, that's kind of the member levels and, and sort of what's required, but you don't need to be a member to take the training. You can simply take the training because you're interested in it. And we have a lot of different offerings. Um, we, we try to offer things that are very relevant. And I would point out that um, thanks to COVID-19, all of our uh, training is currently offered online. And so where it used to be that you might want to attend a training, but it was you know not being offered in your area, well, that's no longer an issue. And uh, I think that's one of the silver linings we have to be thankful for in this situation. Um, you know, six months ago, I, I, I'm not sure that I would have been able to do this. I would have had to maybe fly to Pakistan, but yeah. now because uh, we've all been forced online, we can all actually perhaps come a little closer together. And with the Chartered Institute, it's the same. We have a lot of offerings online now, um, that we didn't several months ago. So I would encourage everyone to go and look at the training diary and see if there's anything that interests you. We have everything from free introductory courses to alternative dispute resolution, which, by the way, if you're a student member, is a, is a free course, um, and all the way up to very specialized uh, courses in, in various aspects of uh, mediation, adjudication, or arbitration. Excellent. So uh, thank you very much uh, for this Just overview, uh, Marty. Uh, Nasir, uh, over to you, but I would like to mention here uh, something that, you know, uh, I became an associate member of the Chartered Institute in 2006, I believe. And I actually hosted the, the then director general of the Institute at the Research Society of International Law in Lahore uh, in 2007. So uh, since then, there was some initial interest, um, you know, in, in, in the area. 
and so it's really great to see Nasir and the team uh, taking the this forward and you know actually implementing uh, the process of having a branch in Pakistan. So thank you, Nasir, for that. Uh, and and on that, I mean, why a branch in Pakistan, and what's the purpose, and what's the what's the vision behind it? The major perspective of vision behind it is to create a community of learned society so people can learn from each other. As Mercy mentioned, you know, having mentors around you. We've got 50 plus members in Pakistan, but how many Chartered Institute of Arbitrators activities have we seen? Just simple networking session where people can give lectures out of free. We get so many webinars just like this one offered by the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, various different branches, so the members can continue to learn. The law is one of those things that is const constantly evolving. New things come in, new case laws come in, new constitutions come in, new statutory developments come in, and we need to be up to date on that. And that is one of the most important perspective of joining a professional body like the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, where you can continue with your professional development. I think for a fellow, it's a minimum of 40 hours of CPD in a year. For a member, it's about 30 hours of CPD in a year. So you have to demonstrate that, that by continuing to be continuing with your membership with the institution, you are continuously professionally developing uh, in that regard. So, so that would help. Um, having a branch uh, also to create awareness, which is, as I mentioned, was one of the part of the judicial conference, also a CIR manifesto. And from, from my perspective, with my um, roots, as you know, I hail from Karachi. Um, I, I understand the court system a little bit. And I know people who face challenges in um, construction contracts operating in Pakistan. And it's to help them to educate themselves that there are other ways and means from the court where they can access to justice. So hopefully when we have an up and running Chartered Institute of Arbitrators Pakistan branch in Pakistan, we will have more forums, more networking session, more awareness, and people will get to know it's a journey. I mean, we are still learning in the UK um, and access to justice um, and the National Judicial Council just um, published this report back in 2019 about um, ADR compulsion. It's a, it's, a, it's a report, an update on the 2017 report. And uh, I think um, I'll um, just summarize the whole report with um, uh, Frankie Sanders' um, advice, which is there is a difference between coercion into mediation and coercion in mediation. So, so you can't really intimidate someone into ADR uh, and, and there should be no intimidation into ADR. And, and that's the journey in Pakistan. There is no compulsion. It has to be uh, by the party's consent. And uh, this is another area where I researched quite significantly about judicial intervention in Pakistan, uh, specifically in arbitration or other matters. Uh, so hopefully with the benefits that um, institution like Chartered Institute of Arbitrators bring, we will have more awareness and any perceived or real um, intervention uh, by the courts, by uh, lawyers or the users or anybody, we can hopefully uh, clear out any differences and move towards the benefit of the society. And I would like to point out here that, you know, a couple of the, you know, uh, often oft quoted uh, international arbitration related cases in, in Pakistan uh, or related to Pakistan uh, date back before Pakistan became a member state of the New York Convention on Enforcement of for Foreign Arbitral Awards. So that, was, that happened in 2006. But Pakistan is a dualist state. So it didn't become part of the Pakistani body of law till actually 2011. Yes. So, so I think uh, although we do criticize how Pakistan's judiciary intervened in, um, in matters where things have, should have gone to and left to international arbitration, we should be now mindful that, you know, it's a relatively recent phenomena that the judiciary has had the, the local laws supported in its, uh, in its decision making 
on, on such cases. And now, frankly, we do see uh, the enforcement of foreign arbitral awards taking place in Pakistan. They're very limited grounds uh, for, for courts to intervene uh, you know, in relation to an award. And those are, are similar to what we would see and expect in most other jurisdictions. And as early as as recently as 2019, there have been ADR acts in relation yeah. to Islamabad, but also Punjab. Punjab is one of the provinces in Pakistan, uh, the largest uh, in terms of the population. Uh, and that provides for ADR authorities to be set up there who can uh, certify uh, ADR professionals, but also ADR centers. Uh, again, uh, rules need to be formed under those uh, uh, under the, the, the those laws, so uh, still very new. And uh, again, I, I suspect that this COVID nineteen situation has disrupted and interrupted a number of things. Uh, but at the same time, we are uh, seeing courts adopting e hearings now, at least on an ad hoc basis in Pakistan. Uh, that's likely to uh, to go on for a bit. Uh, at least one of the high courts, uh, the Islamabad High Court, just yesterday. Uh, asked all councils appearing in cases if they would like to opt for e-hearing in relation to their case because of you know a variety of reasons, uh, and that's a request that the court will consider. So we are moving in a direction where a lot of these things can happen. Um, Nasir's point is absolutely valid that you know they it, it they can't be forced ADR or mediation or of course not arbitration. Um, so so the courts have the option now at least in parts of Pakistan, uh, under specific law, but otherwise generally all over Pakistan, to allow the parties to adopt an ADR mechanism to, dis to resolve the dispute uh, and avoid a very lengthy litigation process. So let's see how that goes. Uh, one of the, the, the things that came up in our discussion today was about you know how CPD is important. Apart from Pakistan and some uh, UK, of course, uh, I'm in... Uh, I'm registered as a as a legal consultant in, in Dubai as well. And uh, I'm highlighting this because Pakistani lawyers in Pakistan generally perceive that the Middle Eastern legal systems are you know, way behind Pakistan. So I just want to highlight that to remain, to maintain your, uh, your authorization to practice law in, in UAE, uh, in particular in Dubai, you need to attend a number of CPD courses every year. And uh, at the moment, we are trying to meet those requirements through online courses. And it doesn't depend; doesn't matter if you are a young lawyer or, or a partner at a law firm. You, we all have to do it. So, so, so that is very important. So, the question from another uh, lawyer is that: Have we seen ADR training being incorporated into law degrees or such CPD courses? What's our respective experience been, and is it something that we recommend? Uh, of course, I do. So uh, maybe, Athena, we can start with you. What are your thoughts on this? Uh, may, may I just, uh, before I give my thoughts on, on this, uh, reply to two of the comments that I have seen in the live uh, comments uh, dialogue there. Uh, one is just to, perhaps we need to clarify what the New York Convention is, because there was a question as to whether ADR and decisions right. reached uh, within the ADR processes are enforceable or not. Uh, so the, the answer, very short answer, and, and oversimplified, of course, is that uh, for arbitration, in most cases, they are enforceable, if, uh, foreign um, arbitration awards, and for mediation, we are getting there. Uh, when it comes to arbitration, the, the New York Convention that you have heard us discuss about is a convention um, signed or entered into by the majority of states uh, around the globe today, um, via which the states have agreed that they will enforce internally uh, an award, an arbitration award, as if it were a, a, a judgment of the second or more than the second degree of jurisdiction. Actually, that they can only refuse enforcement of an arbitration award, of a foreign arbitration award, on very limited grounds. Uh, recently, there has been an initiative about creating a similar, putting forward a, a similar convention for agreements reached in mediation proceedings. Um, and, and, and this is, therefore, where, where it all goes towards. Uh, 
we, we are going towards a world whereby parties, people can decide how they want to resolve their disputes. And there will be a framework, an international framework, allowing uh, such resolution of disputes to be binding. So that was just one parenthesis. And the other parenthesis is that uh, I saw that some people have had uh, difficulties accessing the CR website. Uh, I understand that there is a maintenance uh, going on, uh, which will be concluded by Wednesday. So put it in your to-do list for next weekend to, to discover uh, all the opportunities that uh, CR can, uh, can, can offer. I, I would also just jump in really quickly and say, if you're trying to access the website from Pakistan, because it's hosted on UK servers, sometimes that can cause security flags. So try using a VPN. <laughs> to access it if, if you have the ability to do that instead and see if that helps. But yes, we do have maintenance going on from time to time, for sure. I would also so, point out that yesterday was the 65th birthday of the New York Convention, which is also the most signed and um, most successful international treaty ever now at this, at this time. So um, well, hopefully the Singapore Mediation Convention will reach that status as well. Mm -hmm. So, so over to you, Nasser. What do you think about uh, you know ADR training and CBD courses and all that? Um, it's, so, um, so there are some comments about ADR training, and um, there's three questions on it. In undergraduate degrees, I haven't seen um, a large um, content about ADR from that perspective. Generally seen as a specialization master's courses, uh, LLM, et cetera, and dispute resolution and arbitration. That's that's what I did, uh, a master's in uh, dispute resolution and arbitration. Uh, I think, Mercy, Athia, you, you've both done this kind of same from Queen Mary, I guess. Um, and um, generally, in undergraduate degrees, you're, you're generally just reliant on doing a bit of thesis and research in that aspect. Um, why is that? I, I don't think I'm the person to be able to answer that, that why we don't have enough content of um, alternative dispute resolution in um, undergraduate law degrees. Uh, so that is something that needs to be seen. And that's probably where um, institution like Chartered Institute of Arbitrators would help if you want to work in a specialized field. Um, as you know, lawyers can go into so many different parts, whether you're going towards criminal law, civil law, within civil law, then you can, you know, dive down into so many different deep down fields. Dispute resolution and ADR is another specialized field uh, which seem to be flourishing and fulfilling. Now, um, how would a model like that be experimented and uh, continued in Pakistan? I think, as you mentioned, Temur, with the REACT, in 2011, the implementation, uh, and just mercy, Pakistan signed the New York Convention in 1958, uh, one of the one of the earlier countries to yeah. do so. Um, and also another fact that a lot of people in Pakistan should know, Pakistan was actually the first com country to sign a bilateral investment treaty. Uh, with, right. Germany. Right. Yep. Yeah. with Germany, yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so, so Pakistan was the first country. So there's a lot of first uh, that Pakistan is always, you know, excelling uh, from that perspective. So there is no doubt that in ADR, in demonstration of ADR, Pakistan will soon excel. And as we say, the more, inshallah. Inshallah. I mean, I would like to say for, for the sake of the audience uh, that we signed in 1958, but we didn't ratify it till uh, mid or end of uh, 2005, right? Yeah. So... And for Pakistan, ratification and uh, you know is an important step. So countries sign but then don't ratify. If we, if you've been following the ICC and Trump uh, drama over the last few days, you know in, in that context, the U.S. did once I think sign or was was one of the the countries uh, you know uh, behind ICC and then backed out. So till you ratify something, you you know you're not a a state party and then in, in state countries like pakistan you need to uh, have implementing legislation as well so uh please nasir yeah i want to also talk about um another offering uh, that cir does uh, which is in addition to training in addition to having a professional membership is the dispute appointment service so so um I know, Mercy, you can probably help me with this uh, a bit as well. But what DAS does is it provides um, quick, confidential, and 
cost effective methods of settlement there is a complete range of adr methods uh, the institute has its own um, rules to work on a uh, remote dispute resolution so even if the parties are based in any country they can still access that justice through the dispute appointment service by by the cir um so i sit on one of the panels um as you know to be appointed as an arbitrator or adjudicator from that perspective but what the das does is it aids and and gives the confidence that the arbitrator or the adjudicator or the mediator that you are appointing is actually accredited has gone through some form of professional training and accreditation before you can appoint somebody and then you can be sure of that the award that is coming out of it will hopefully not be challenged in case of you know uh, procedural errors or, or or other matters so it gives you that confidence that you are approaching a reputable organization and a reputable institution to ask for justice right so i would i would uh follow on with a couple of things first of all the dispute appointment service technically at its heart is an appointing authority so we are not an administrating institution um we curate our own uh, arbitral rules but these are by definition ad hoc so parties can use these rules without ever even telling us without ever notifying us at all it's simply uh, a system that we recommends that if parties are in a dispute and they don't want to go to an institution they want to try to resolve it themselves or perhaps they're experienced enough to be able to do that that they can use our rules as an ad hoc alternative to for example the unsatural commercial rules um or to the ad hoc rules that are available in their domestic legislation we have our own ad hoc rules available and the way they were developed was a committee of fellows and chartered arbitrators from around the world came together and put together what they thought was sort of best practice um rules so once parties agree to those rules they are bound by them but we do not administrate them so we may not we don't even know how many how many um parties use them but we do know uh based on recent case law from various jurisdictions that that parties around the world do use them so for example we've had uh in the last week um we've had a supreme court of the united states um decision uh on on an arbitration where the parties were arbitrating under the chartered institute's rules so um these are used by parties around the world and and um but we do not administrate them we also have now a um expedited offering um cost controlled expedited rules for parties to use um that i personally i sit on the unsatral working group too which is trying to develop unsatral expedited rules and this is what we have put forward as the model for best practices when doing an expedited arbitration um to be clear about the the level at which expedited arbitration would be invoked and then basically to leave everything else to the arbitrator in a, in a nutshell so if you again these are to be used under ad hoc circumstances but i think you know at the heart of it and you and you hit on it nasir we are an appointing authority so if you need a, a neutral for your dispute and you want to ensure that your neutral is someone who is you know certified trained experienced um and comes with the recommendation of a notable institution then we keep panels of these people who are fellows of ours they are all fellows and once you become a fellow you can be on one of our panels um we have them for adjudicators as well as mediators as well as arbitrators and so um yes that's that's one of it's not just a member benefit although it is a member benefit it's a benefit of fellowship but it is also a way that we um can put into practice sort of the 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 things that we know from from our members and from being a thought leader we can actually put them into practice by being uh, an appointing authority and providing parties with these tools that they can actually use in their disputes as to the remote um remote proceeding so our our remote uh it, it isn't necessarily a set of rules for remote hearings I think each institution has their own um but as i say we we're not telling parties what rules to operate under when they're virtual what we have is a guidance note so what we've put together is what we think is um and again we put this together uh a couple of months ago in response to uh just a flood of parties having to move their disputes online 
and people looking for guidance. So we put this together, but it will be updated because three months on, we've actually learned quite a lot. Um, but it's basically guidance for things for parties to keep in mind if they are going to do their dispute resolution proceedings in a virtual forum. We've got a handy checklist that you can go through and tick everything off to see if you've, you know, and hopefully if you follow these things, it will it will help streamline the process and, and you know, your outcome will be not any different than if you had been face to face. That's the hope. So the guidance note is, uh, is available along with all of our other professional practice guidelines. All of these things, all of these rule sets, um, schemes that we have, we have specialized schemes for, for particular types of disputes. Uh, these are all found on our website. Um, they're all publicly available and free. You don't need to yeah. go through a lawyer. You don't need to pay a fee or be a member to access them. They're all publicly available under our resources section on our website. Excellent. Cost Thank effective. You Thank you yes, for that. Yes, we hope so. <laughs> so so uh, I, I know we've reached the, the one hour limit, but I, I do have one final question to ask. And uh, that's because I think we, we all need to focus on diversity and inclusion, uh, especially in our profession uh, as well. And uh, Athena, this, this question is for you because I noticed that uh, on the CIR website, uh, you, you're also listed under the women in ADR uh, page. So you know how important is this and uh, what's being done? Because Pakistan generally, uh, we've seen that uh, uh, women have been hesitant to come into the profession or if they have, they've avoided litigation or arbitration and done mostly uh, corporate or advisory work. That's changing now. We have, in fact, a women in law initiative in Pakistan as well. Uh, so, so what are your thoughts on that, um, Athena? And then maybe Mercy as well, please. My, my thoughts are that there is there is place for everyone, and and diversity is. Uh, is, is a fantastic and, and is a fantastic element for dispute resolution as well. Um, I practice in France, where one can see new boutique firms um, being created, uh, consisting of only women partners. Uh, oh. One can see uh, more and more often um, clients requesting uh, to have uh, women or a majority of women or at least certain women in the team who will be dealing with their case. Um, because because this is uh, enrichment. It brings enrichment. It, bring, it brings uh, several qualities, several different qualities in the team which will handle the, the dispute. Just one additional note that I would like to, to, to mention that's very, very important to me. When we talk about diversity, it's on, not only diversity regarding women, uh, it's gender diversity. We, we need in international dispute resolution, people coming from different backgrounds. Uh, I am also a member of, a, of an association uh, that uh, whose, whose objective is to, force, to, to, to foster um, the, the progress of arbitration in the African continent and, and also to be able to, to market African arbitrators for, for general disputes. Uh, so yeah, by by all means, uh, we need to get there. We are we we are going there. Uh, seven, huge progress has been made, but there is still a lot of uh, a lot of progress to be made in the, in the of future. Of course, of course. Mercy, anything from from your side on this? Oh yes, um, definitely. I'll try to be brief. Um, so when I, as I say, when I started out as a student member, one of the things that I found uh, to be so exciting about the Chartered Institute is that there were so many female mentors available to me. And um, while the legal profession, generally speaking, um, is opening up a lot more to women, in fact, in the US right now, graduates of law programs are 50-50, in fact, moving slightly to being more women. Um, but retention after 10 years is a problem. And I think that that's because, well, it's not just a matter of gender, as Athena points out. If you don't see anyone like you doing what you're doing, it's very hard for you to imagine yourself ever attaining further achievement in that field. So if I don't see any other women in senior positions, I will be discouraged. If I am a, from a certain region and I don't see any practitioners that look like me attaining positions, then why I'm going to feel very discouraged. If I, um, as a young practitioner, don't see any other young practitioners 
um, where I don't see anyone that's slightly ahead of me, but I only see people who are very, very far ahead of me, then I become very discouraged. Um, and so this is this is something that's very important that I, I think of, uh, organizations like the one Athena mentioned and, and like ours um, do to foster diversity. I would I would point out that uh, we have a problem of optics in arbitration in particular um, because people see arbitrators. They don't necessarily see the practitioners. And I would have to say my personal experience is that practitioners are a very diverse group of people, extremely open, welcoming, diverse on al almost every point. But arbitrators, the ones that we know about in the, in the um, awards that are published publicly, for example, ISDS awards, they mm. are very heavily male, European and older, um, with one or two exceptions, uh, who, who, and if they are exceptions, they are famous in the world. Um, but this is pretty much the standard for the public perception of what is an arbitrator. It's a very aged white male. Um, and I think this is unfair. It gives an arbitration an unfair reputation because what you don't see is that everyone else involved in the profession is quite diverse and that that even is changing. One of the big ways I think it's going to change is because, is actually now because of everything that's happening now, younger members are going to have, young, younger practitioners are going to have a great opportunity because, I mean, for example, we were talking before uh, we went live about, I, I, I'm not very familiar with social media, but because someone who is familiar with social media can network right now in ways that I, I mean, I can't do face-to-face -face networking, so I have to do social media networking because I don't know how to do that. I'm a little bit, you know, behind the curve. But if you already know how to do that, then your networking skills and your networking has not stopped. In fact, it may have gotten more busy. Um, in the same way, if you're a young arbitrator who understands and is comfortable with virtual hearings and with the technology, you may have just beaten out an older, more experienced arbitrator simply because you know how to use the technology and this does not scare you in any way and you don't see any problems with it. The party is going to say, oh, well, then let's pick this person because they've done not just arbitration, but virtual arbitration before. Um, so I think that opportunities are going to start coming fast and furious, especially with the increase in the volume of disputes that we're going to see after after the pandemic, especially commercial disputes. So I would say we do have a, an optical problem, but I think that it's important to realize that actual diversity within the profession, it's becoming better. Mm -hmm. And if you are someone who has attained, if you're a, a woman or you are, if you're a Pakistani practitioner who is under the age of 30 and you can mentor someone who is maybe 25, um, that gives that person that sort of inspiration and comfort that they belong, that they belong here. And that's it's so much easier when you know that there are others like you on whatever that point is in the profession. Excellent. Thank you for this. Uh, Nasir, any final words generally on the discussion today or, or this? Two points um, very quickly. Um, the new director general for CIAB is a woman, uh, yes. Catherine Dixon. Uh, improving diversity in the profession from that perspective. But um, as Mercy mentioned, it's not just about gender. In the UK, the Equality Act, et cetera, there is nine protective characteristics. So you have got to think about race, religion, sexual orientation, um, whether somebody is disabled or not. And the problem is with coronavirus and everything else going on, I think uh, the pandemic of racism is corrosive to our society and must be actively opposed. Um, so, so, so that's the comment on diversity and inclusion perspective. And um, overall, generally, um, thank you very much for today. Thank you, Mercy. Thank you, Athena, for joining, for your very thoughtful, very intelligent views on dispute resolution, arbitration, the proactiveness of ADR, and um, giving out the benefits of um, young lawyers, non-lawyers, and everybody in the field who want to enjoy and have access to justice with accessible dispute resolution ADR processes um, should look at um, looking at the content of Charter Initiative Arbitrator, uh, look to see joining us. And um, if there are any questions further to this chat, always uh, willing to answer and help anybody who's got any questions. 
Thank you very much, Nasser, for this. Uh, it's been it's been very useful for me personally as well. Uh, I, I, I'm sure people will benefit from this discussion. I hope that many will come forward and become members, uh, and students will come forward and become student members and take advantage of the the resources, uh, the free resources that are that are on offer at the moment. Uh, so, with that note, uh, thank you, and uh, hope that you know this is not the the first and the last session with the institute and with with the three of you uh, hopefully we can do this again as well uh, thank you for your time today thank you very much Simon. thank you thank you for having us